In this video, we look at the process of extending an existing simulation model to accommodate indoor air quality as an additional design concern. Indoor air quality is a topic which probably should come up a lot more often. Why? Well, design teams seem to foist all kinds of manner of discomfort on building occupants. Here's an example. It's been replicated with minor variants across the built environment. Even when they're designed for like ad hoc meeting spaces with niches and whiteboards, as happened in the mechanical engineering department where I spent a decade, more than a handful of folks actually attempted to use the space. The indoor air quality quickly deteriorated to the point where I really want to take this conversation someplace else. Why? Well, in a building with mechanical ventilation and not a few air-conditioned spaces, no one thought it worthwhile to include any provision in the corridors. Researchers in my group have long argued and hoped that better information during the design process would help design teams make better decisions. One of my colleagues, Azaz Samuel, got a PhD from integration of contaminant tracking into simulation. And if you're into indoor air quality, the possible areas of inquiry are wide and they're deep. You can get lost in it. There are a number of things that folk might want to measure in the real world. And, well, an awful lot of them are included in the virtual world of simulation. Those with passion can track stuff like VOCs in great detail. And there are folk with the background and access to the supporting data who are absolutely not put off by the pedantic nature of simulation facilities. Well, but that's rather scary if our task is to answer that should we be worried question. Turns out that most of what is needed for simple indoor air quality studies, it can be derived from the attributes of the building, and the surfaces and the air movement paths that are already there. So in this video, we're going to look at a sequence of tasks to take an existing medium resolution model of small offices so that it is capable of tracking CO2 levels. I'm using some new functionality I recently developed in order to facilitate indoor air quality setup. You might have seen this model. It's one of the training exemplars distributed with ESVR. It was designed to assess facade upgrade options as well as supporting visual and thermal comfort assessments. When a new question comes in, we have to think, okay, what can we keep? What do we need to add? We need to look back and see what the tool supports. ESPR supports contaminant assessments if the model includes information on contaminant sources, in this case, CO2 emitted by occupants in each of the zones. Our model already has schedules of occupancy from which we can infer those emissions. Of course, this needs to be overlaid over the outside ambient CO2 level, which is, let's call it, 432 parts per million. We also need some sort of dynamic air transport vector. We need to move from an abstract imposed air distribution to one based on leakage characteristics of the building for this, we need an airflow network. However, moving from an imposed to computed airflows is going to alter the thermophysical state of the rooms quite a lot, and we're going to be making a sequence of changes. Best to work on a copy. This gives us a fallback as well as the ability to run comparative assessments. Let's open up our copy. And what we'd like is to edit our changes into this small office shad.cfg. We need to add attribution. I've got a door and it's got an undercut on it. Or I have a window frame and it's got a trickle vent in it. What I'd like to do is insert into this model those attributes, but I also I want to add, for simplicity, a grill in the passage adjacent to these two offices where 
I'm going to pull fresh air from a mechanical ventilation system. So to do that, I need to go and focus on that passageway. So I'm going to go into the building, into the geometry, and I'm going to find that passageway. Okay, so I want to insert into that ceiling a rectangle. So I'm going to go into the surface list, add a surface, insert it into the ceiling, and it's going to be within the surface. And now I'm putting a rectangular surface in the ceiling. And it says, is that all right? Good enough. I'm going to call it grill. Um, I'm going to make it out of a um, some gray steel. I'm going to say its use is of type grill. And that then pulls up the ability to put some air leakage choices in here might be a crack, might be a mechanical ventilation inlet, which is what I want, uh, might be natural airflow duct or something like that. So, but I want it an inlet and save changes. Okay, so now I have a new surface properly bounded set at that. Now, while I'm at it, I need to attribute the doors. I have a door to each of the offices um, so what I want to do is go back to surface attributes, see a little bit more information about surface attributes, and I want to find a thing called door. And that's it? Yes. Okay, so use type. I want to turn it from an ordinary surface, and I want to say this is a door. And it's got an undercut. And please save that. Okay. Now I want to go to um, the other door. See, now I have door undercut is one of the attributes. I want to find the door B. Okay. And I also want to change it to type door with an undercut. Now I'm going to save that. And then I'm going to, yep. I've got a new thing. I'm going to update the constructions for that. Now I'm going to go into the manager. And I've read that in. And I look at, um, I go in to, again to surface attributes. And I see a door undercut. It has inherited the um, undercut from the passageway. Now I've got a glass here and I've got a frame around the glass. What I'd like to do is put a bit of crackage around the perimeter of the glass itself and put a trickle vent into the frame so that there's a airflow path um, for leakage, but also for the fresh air being delivered to the passageway, comes under through the door and then out through the trickle vent. Here's the frame. Yep, it's highlighted, and I want to change that from an ordinary surface, and I want to make it a frame in the facade. And I want to say there's a trickle vent there. And I want to find the glazing. Okay, there's the glazing, and I want to declare that as a type of window in the facade that has a crack. So now I've got those two defined. So I've got a way for air to come in. I've got a way for air to come out. And I'm going to go and do this, save this, and then move on to the other zone and do a similar sort of thing. Okay, so I'm going to save that. I've attributed 
the surfaces in my model. And now I can exit up and say network fluid flow. I want to turn on and create a flow network based on these attributes. So I go here and I say I want a new network. And I want to scan the surface use attributes to create that network. And it's provided me with some defaults. So it's going to put two millimeter cracks. That's fine. Door undercuts on the internal it's 15 millimeters. Um, that's probably all right. I've got the trickle vent, 10 millimeters tall. Let's just change that slightly to set a global preference of say 20 millimeters tall. Okay, now uh, let's proceed and create that, that network. So apply it to all the rooms and um, so it was going to create a network um, it's creating flow nodes and then for each of the zones it's then going to uh, create a series of nodes and components linking everything together and now it's noticed the grill and it's asking what we want to do with it so I want to use it as a constant volume flow rate component. Now, normally there are one person in each office, but occasionally there are more people in there. For general first start on indoor air quality, let's say 30 meters cubed per hour per person. So I've got two people that this is delivering to, so I want 60 cubic meters per hour. And so meters cubed per hour, 60. And we'll now be able to see what happens when there are more people in the room. How does the air quality deteriorate? And so that's so many meters cubed per second. Yes, that's fine. Okay, so now um, and I'm saying, where do you get this air from? So there's a node that's been created always called ambient. And that's where I'll take my source from. And so now we want to link things together. And I'll accept the linkage and save that. Here's my boundary nodes with a little circle on it. There's the two cracks. Um, there's the uh, trickle vents there. Goes to the node for each of the offices. Goes under the door to the node in the corridor, and then here's my supply. So, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I've created that. Now, what I want to do is now say contaminants. So I've got occupants in the rooms, I've got my flow network, so now I should be able to, and it's going to tell me some of the things it's going to be doing, here. So I say, please auto setup. Now, an expert could go into manual setup and put in incredible amounts of information. In this case, auto setup is going to do what we want. And so it's going to uh, put in an ambient CO2 uh, related to the outside, um, and then it's going to look for rooms that have occupants in them and and set up relationships with those occupant descriptions so that when the simulation runs um, the contaminant source is provided based on the activity level of the occupant. Yes, so please enable that. It's going to save that to a file. Um, now one question it asks is um, what kind of solution time step do we need? Now, it's normally four time steps per hour for the building in this model. Recommendation is that, that be, we, we make it double that um, for the solution of contaminants. And with that, um, we can save the information. The synopsis, 
basically, if I look back over here, I've got one contaminant. It has an ambient concentration, and that's been associated with each of the nodes as a starting point. Um, I've got no chemical reactions defined. Um, there are no additional information there. I have a source based on personal CO2 emissions, and I have a type that I'm creating called occupants. And then each of the zone uh, nodes in the flow network then are associated with that type of source. So that's my contaminant model. If you were going to change some things, you might go in and look at any of these particular kinds and say, yes, overwrite that and update that we do actually want contaminants included in our model. And I'll just save that again. And so what I want to do is go to simulation. And um, there is a winter period, which um, goes through January and February. So I can run a simulation based on that. Okay, so let's initiate a simulation. Just watch it as it goes by. Okay, two months. Takes hardly any time at all. And results analysis. Okay, um, what I want to do is go into graphs, um, network flows. Here's my network. And let's look at contaminants at those three nodes based on the occupant source type. And there we are. Zoom in a little bit on the display period. We can see that we've got um, varying amounts happening over time. So there's our ambient down here. This is in the, the greenest passageway. Um, it's around thousand parts per million, but we can certainly see that um, at different times um, we're getting over 2,000 parts per million, and that really is related to when there's additional people in the spaces. So let's zoom in a little bit closer to, say, looking at a week and draw that. Yeah, so there we've got additional people coming in. Therefore, that particular amount of fresh air coming in is not really conducive with good air quality. So that's the process. And we can then um, go back in and talk to our colleagues and the design team about, well, we probably want to put some sort of control involved in this so that the flow rates do actually respond to measured CO2 levels in the room, and it ramps up the fresh air rate. So that is the process for a model which requires additional attributes. A model which already has a flow network, well, the process is, of course, much simpler. To learn more, there's an example model that comes with the SPR, it looks at a dozen variants of occupants, mechanical ventilation, natural ventilation, and one variant has time-based controls, and one has CO2-based controls. Loading it up, well, essentially you've got the same I office that's been replicated over three levels to form a matrix of design variants. Simulation 
thus responds to the attributes and directives within that matrix. And, of course, everything can be compared with everything. For example, here are the statistics on contaminants across that matrix. And, well, graphs, they show the evolution over time. And you can study a bit more and see how, for example, mixing boxes are used to deliver a mix of fresh air and recirculated air to some of the rooms. It's a great way to learn and explore. I commend it to you.